Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Morgan Bowen, um, and I'm a member of the MSU College of Nursing Alumni Board. And it is my uh, pleasure to moderate this broadcast of Conversations, which is a series of webinars uh, sponsored by the college. And today's, uh, the topic of today's webinar is mental health and self-care for nurses. And uh, the, present, the presenter will be Michael Martel, who is, or I'm sorry, Martel, there's a little bit of an accent there on the second syllable. He's a College of Nursing instructor and a current DNP student. So I do have to begin with a provider disclosure statement. Our speaker attests that no financial relationship exists between himself and any commercial supporting entity, which would represent a conflict of interest or commercialize any presentation content. And there are no CEUs available for today's presentation. And now I'd like for you to meet the presenter. While working as an emergency room nurse, uh, Martel saw many of his colleagues in a state of stress after treating patients, which led him to research various coping methods and resources. Through his research, Martel came across the US Army Battle Buddy Program. Uh, he's currently piloting a similar Battle Buddy Program based off of these principles with the APRN students in the College of Nursing as a method of providing ongoing peer-to-peer -peer emotional support. In using what he learned, Martel will focus on the teachings of mindfulness, guided imagery, positive self-talk, and other resources in a time when our healthcare professionals need them the most. I encourage everybody to type their questions into the Q&A box throughout the presentation. So there's a little tab at the bottom um, at the bottom menu bar of the Zoom screen uh, that should say Q&A. And we'll do uh, the questions and answers at the end uh, when Michael finishes. So we'll have time for that. Um, so Michael, welcome. I'm gonna hand it on over to you. Good afternoon. Um, today we'll be discussing mental health and self-care for nurses. I would like to first say thank you all for attending and I am very grateful for the opportunity to present on this important topic. The tar target audience is all nurses, whether you're a nurse at the bedside, APRNs, um, such as myself, nursing students or our future nurses, and nurse faculty. However, many of these techniques and information discussed could easily, easily be utilized by other healthcare workers and support staff, and even within other disciplines. The current COVID-19 pandemic has been very traumatic and stressful experience for many in the nursing profession. I'm very proud of the hard work of all nurses, nursing students, healthcare workers, and support staff during this difficult time. I'm very glad that you took uh, time out of your day today to practice self-care simply by attending this webinar today. As a nurse myself, I've watched many of my colleagues experience emotional distress following emotionally difficult experiences in the clinical setting. The repeated exposure to emotionally difficult experiences and stressors can lead to PTSD, depression, anxiety, burnout, substance abuse, and even nurse suicide. As our graphic indicates, it's okay not to be okay. If you or a colleague is experiencing emotional distress, there truly is help available. Watching many of my colleagues and myself experience emotional distress, both prior to COVID-19 pandemic and during the COVID-19 pandemic, this led me to developing a passion for improving men nurse mental health and self-care. This webinar will be recorded as you mentioned and shared following the event. So I wanna begin by sharing a little bit more about my background. I've spent most of my nursing career working in emergency nursing as a staff nurse in administration and in staff education. I've also worked as a stroke coordinator in med surge as a mental health tech, um, and most recently as an instructor at the MSU College of Nursing. I'm also in the, on the College of Nursing Wellness Committee, and I am a board certified adult gerontological clinical nurse specialist. I'm three months away from earning my DNP also at MSU. Um, I have always been passionate about mental health and particularly nursing wellness and self-care. As an instructor, I prioritize care, self-care and mental health for the nursing students in my course. We start each class with a short activity focused on mental health and self-care. 
we feel that if nursing students can develop their coping skills and self-care in nursing school, when they graduate as nurses, they will hopefully be already have some of the tools that they can then face many challenges of professional nursing. My DMP work is focused on, the, on these topics as well. I'll talk about my DMP work a little bit later in the presentation. So these are some results from a recent survey of over 10,000 nurses across the US conducted by the American Nurses Foundation. This is a branch of the American Nurses Association. The survey measures the feelings of the nurses surveyed. The survey was conducted from March 20th to July 6th, 2020, and really demonstrates the significant impact on nurses' mental health as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Pre-COVID-19, nursing has been identified as a very stressful occupation and COVID-19 really has exacerbated this. So as you can see in this graph, over 50% of nurses felt that they were overwhelmed in the 14 days prior to answering the survey. 48% were anxious, over 48% irritable, and 40% were sad. So you can see quite other feelings were listed here as well, such as anger, feeling numb, guilt, life is a failure. The answers in blue were those positive uh, domains. Over a quarter of the respondents were optimistic, resilient, confident in the ability to handle things and like life holds meaning. As a nurse myself, I can say that I have felt the majority of these things at some point in my career. Unfortunately, as nurses, we have often have little to no control over the stressors themselves. But what we do have control over is taking the time to practice self-care, taking the steps to give enough attention to our mental health so that we are equipped with the tools to build resilience and improve emotional well-being. We'll discuss this a bit more throughout the presentation. The survey on the previous slide included all registered nurses. When, when emotional well-being, mental health, and nurses are being discussed, we often see an image of a stressed out nurse in the ED or ICU taking care of COVID patients on ventilators. While nurses working in these populations do experience as high levels of stress, I've experienced this myself as an ER nurse, so definitely high levels of stress, I wanted to recognize that there are many other nurses, mental health nurses, nursing administrators, nursing faculty, nurse educators, care managers, nurse researchers, community health nurses, and nurses in many different settings, I could go on, that experience stress. However, the source of the stress might be different for each area of focus. As an adult gerontology clinical nurse specialist, I wanted to take a minute, and an APRN myself, I wanted to take a minute to discuss a study of APRNs and physician assistants at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. The study found that of 1,014 participants, 56% had reported that they had previously or currently experienced burnout. It is well documented in the literature that burnout leads to anxiety, depression, and many other mental health issues. It's also important to note that this survey was conducted in 2018 prior to any impact from the COVID-19 pandemic. So COVID-19 added uh, additional stress to an already stressed nursing workforce. So what does working in a profession with high stress, high burnout, anxiety, and depression lead to? Well, unfortunately, a high risk of suicide in nurses than in the general population. We really need to be aware of this. And this is why I bring this up. I can't stress this awareness piece enough. If you're having any thoughts of suicide, there are free resources to help. Or a colleague is having thoughts of, free, um, of uh, suicide, there are free resources that can help. We will review these specific resources later on in the presentation. But if you observe that a colleague seems overwhelmed, emotionally distraught, or just seems different than usual, make sure to have a further conversation with them. Connect them with the resources that I will discuss later on. As nurses, we truly all are all in this together and we need to be there for one another. Okay. So while I'm very excited and proud of my work um, on my DMP uh, project Battle Buddies, this will really not be the focus of this presentation. I did want to take some time, however, to discuss some of my work. Experiences in emergency nursing and the current COVID-19 pandemic 
really led me into an exploration into the inter interventions that could address emotional well being and resilience in nurses. So I discovered the US Army Battle Buddy intervention. This is based off of the Battle Buddy program, the US Army Battle Buddy program. The Battle Buddy program in the US Army is a way for soldiers of similar rank to provide ongoing peer to peer emotional support. I'm currently implementing a similar program in the College of Nursing with APRN students as my DNP project. I wanted to next share some highlights of the program. So as I mentioned, the Battle Buddy program is a way to provide that ongoing peer-to-peer -peer emotional support focused on the ADP model. What this is, is it deals with anticipating stressors, right? These stressors are gonna come, but we anticipate them. Developing a plan for resilience, building that plan in for resilience. So when they come, we know how to deal with those stressors and connecting with resources if needed. Along with pairing battle buddies based on years of experience and area of expertise, I provide participants with resources and strategies that promote resilience and help manage stress. I lead two to three battle buddy workshops as well with the same goal in mind. The purpose of battle buddies is truly so that battle buddy pairs can validate each other's feelings, provide that peer to peer emotional support, and then they share stress relieving strategies. What worked well, what didn't? When I say validate feelings, it means that their feelings are acceptable. You're letting, know, letting them know that their feelings are truly acceptable. They are not though, however, mental health professionals. So if emotional distress is identified, the battle buddy can connect the peer with resources, mental health professionals that can help. The goals are to build resilience, improve emotional well-being, and leave work at work so that when you are home, you are not focusing on the stressors from the workplace. In the hospital setting, a similar battle buddy program is being implemented by the University of Minnesota Hospital. I used a lot of uh, their article as well um, in some of their strategies that they used as a response to emotional distress due to COVID-19 in the hospital setting. If you're a hospital administrator, I really encourage you to consider implementing battle buddies or a similar intervention within your organization. If you are not a hospital administrator and your organization maybe doesn't have a formalized battle buddy program, that's okay. You can partner up with one of your colleagues on your own, check in on their emotional be well-being two to three times a week. If you identify concerns, you can connect them with some of the resources I'll be providing later on. We are truly all in this together and we need to be there for one another. If you have any further questions about the Battle Buddy program, please let me know. I will be providing my contact info later in this presentation. Okay. So first, I would like to take a few minutes to determine where you are in the stress. Um, I'd like you to take a few minutes to determine where you are in the stress continuum. So we'll just kind of go through this. So, you know, thriving, I got this all the way through in crisis and I can't survive this. So take a few minutes um, and kind of reflect on this. It is possible to experience symptoms from two or more columns along the way. And also it's important to note that everybody perceives stress differently. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to just kind of look at this and self-reflect. Okay, at some point, if you find yourself on this continuum and you're struggling or worse, so you're at the struggling point or even worse in crisis mode, I really want you to seek help from a mental health professional. You must seek help from a mental health professional. It's important to self-assess your own mental health and level of stress frequently so you know when you may need this additional help. So this could be helpful. So I wanted to highlight some of the common stressors that nurses may experience. And many of these have increased recently as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This list is certainly doesn't include them all. Nurses are frequently exposed to trauma. Working in the ER myself, I've experienced some traumatic events such as infant death, uh, motor vehicle accidents, verbal and physical violence. Nurses often work long hours mandated overtime and experience work like workplace violence. Nurse, nurses often are focused so much on caring for others that their own self-care is really negatively impacted. Isolation from family and friends, especially with this COVID-19 pandemic, fear of spreading it to others. Fearing for their safety, financial stress, loneliness, 
feeling unsupported or unprepared for their role. One of example of feeling unprepared is with the COVID-19 pandemic. Many nurses were mandated to move from their specialty area, such as let's say the operating room and transfer to the ICU, the ED or a COVID unit, or maybe another area in the hospital that was maybe outside of their expertise. While it was a necessary resource allocation for the hospital as a response to the pandemic, it really left many nurses feeling anxious, scared, or depressed. Maybe this is something you can relate to, or you know somebody that this could relate to. I know many of my colleagues have experienced this as well. Nurses may experience guilt, depression, or anxiety. Those feelings can also be sources of, these stre of stress themselves. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, nurses are often inclined to defer self-care as they care for others. It's a natural instinct as a care provider to just keep going. Um, but during this unprecedented time of crisis, we re must really sit back and adjust our mindset as nurses. In order to take the best care of others, to optimize that care, we must first take care of ourselves. Self-care doesn't have to take up a lot of time. Many of the self-care strategies that I'll discuss and we'll actually be practicing some of these take very little time, but if you practice them regularly, they can really help to improve your mental health and your emotional well-being. In an article by Melnick um, from Ohio State and colleagues published, that'll be published this month in the American Nurse Journal, it's a collaboration of many experts across the nation, including our own Dr. Kathleen Poindexter who's our Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Programs at the MSU College of Nursing, and happens to be my mentor as well. The article discusses promoting nurse mental health. They call for an urgent need to shift from crisis intervention to long-term mental health promo promotion and prevention. Nurses desperately need to develop the tools to cope and manage the many stressors they are faced with each and every day. The authors further go on to state that it is really critical that organizations must support self-care by establishing a culture of wellness. This same team of experts created many of the resources on the ANA um, uh, website that I'll share later on on nurse suicide and prevention. I'll share this uh, later on in the presentation. So here are some examples of some of the stress relieving activities that you can participate in. There's a lot of evidence that yoga can help relieve stress and promote well-being. Mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, which we'll talk more about, self-compassion, physical exercise, cooking and baking, volunteering. Some find prayer or other spiritual religious activities um, stress relieving. Coloring may be helpful. Also music or music therapy. Meditation, support groups, um, you know, now virtual with COVID, but support groups. Daily gratitude, focusing on things that you are grateful for. And adequate nutrition. This list is certainly not all inclusive, but these are some examples. What helps with relieving stress is typically dependent on the individual. So try reflecting now, I want you to take a few minutes or a couple minutes and try to reflect on what your stress relieving activity may be. Maybe this is something you participate in currently or something that you want to participate in in the future. Now I want you to write it down. After you have it written down, schedule yourself some time to practice self-care, actually doing this activity throughout the week. I recommend putting it on your calendar. I know if, if for myself, if it's not on my calendar, it's not done. Um, and so I really think that it's important to schedule that time, block it off in your calendar to participate in self-care. Either during this webinar or right after, take the time to do that today. Um, and, and so as nurses, we really have little or no control over the stressors themselves. However, we can create an action plan. So when we experience these stressors, and ideally prior to, we, prior to, um, prior to having those, prior to experiencing those stressors, we implement those stress relief strategies. And thus we build resilience as we go. Additionally, it's important to have a quiet place you can go to when stressed. So I've recently heard of some hospitals in implementing a designated quiet space on their units for nurses to practice self-care. I think this is an excellent idea. If you're a hospital administrator, I encourage you to consider this for your organization. What a great idea to invest in self-care.
So this eight dimensional wellness model, I wanna share this. It was developed by the University Health Service at University of Michigan. Wellness involves being aware of ourselves as whole people, really including a sense of balance and contentment. It's a feeling that things are going well for us today and can continue to go well for us tomorrow. It's a belief that we have meaningful relationships and a sense of meaning and purpose. Although we may have setbacks or experience stress, we are resilient. We have strength, material resources, and support of others to survive and thrive. Wellness really incorporates all the eight dimensions that are shown. Each dimension of wellness can really impact our overall quality of life because really wellness directly relates to how long we live, longevity, and how well we live, quality of life. We find wellness in the valued roles that we choose, such as friend, nurse, worker, volunteer, student, colleague, various other roles in the community. These roles provide an identity. They drive our daily activities and they really ignite our passions. The eight dimensions uh, model really illustrates this idea that all eight dimensions are interconnected. That's why they're there in a circular relationship. We know, we know how much they connect in our lives. So when we feel financially stressed as an example or increasing debt, we experience emotional distress or anxiety, sometimes leading to physical problems or illnesses, less effectiveness at work, which is op occupational, or maybe even questioning our own meaning and purpose in life. When we are not working occupational, we lose some of our opportunities to interact with others, which this is social. Um, and then we can't get the quality foods and medical care. We need to stay well. Stress, addiction, disappointment, and loss can impact our wellness and balance in our lives. Wellness really requires that we balance work with play and rest and balance out time for recuperation and recovery with living our lives fully and productively and balance the desire for rapid change with the known effectiveness of slow changes to build good habits. Wellness is a conscious, deliberate process that really requires us being aware and making good choices in order to have a more satisfying lifestyle. So I ask you now, have you written down your self-care action plan yet? Have you wrote, written down some activities that you can participate in throughout the week? So if not, I want you to do that now. I wanna remind you to do that now. And maybe to build that time on your calendar, book that time in your calendar today. So as we mentioned before, many nurses frequently experience uh, distress and feelings of guilt. These feelings can lead to anxiety and stress. Self-compassion is being open and understanding of our own suffering so that then you have the opportunity to heal without avoiding it. If we practice self-compassion, we will then be able to be more compassionate and caring for the patients. We recognize that often we are suffering, whether you have just had a patient die in your shift, delivering news of a difficult diagnosis, or speaking to family and friends of a loved one involved in a tra traumatic accident. We need to tell ourselves that it's okay to suffer, it's okay to grieve, and it's okay to cry. Being in touch with these feelings, we can then begin the healing process. The three, three components of self-compassion are friendliness with oneself, so being gentle, kind, encouraging, telling yourself it's okay, you're doing the best you can. Shared humanity, pain and suffering are part of the human experiences. And often as nurses, we kind of, uh, um, you know, want to just toughen up and go um, and just push forward. And often we don't, we don't realize that. And mindfulness. So right now, what I want you to do is I want you to give yourself a hug. Actually give yourself a hug right now, right here, right now. And I want you to cross your arms, grab your shoulders and give yourself a squeeze. And you're going to tell yourself that you're doing the best you can each and every day, and that you do make a positive impact on the lives of others. Show yourself some love and compassion each and every day. So once you've done this, reflect on how that made you feel. Try doing that each day when you leave work. Perhaps when you get in your car after a difficult day at work, you're really stressed. Maybe before you head home, you leave that stress at work. Give yourself some compassion and love every day. So 
So positive self-talk is a cognitive behavioral therapy that really focuses on turning negative thoughts into positive thoughts. This past summer, I attended the MindStrong program in training through the Ohio State University. Positive self-talk and cognitive behavioral therapy are really foundational to their program. After attending their program, I practiced this technique weekly. My colleague and I actually, who attended this program with me, we met weekly for seven weeks as part of the program. Admittedly, I really had some trouble reframing my thoughts at first, but by the end of the program, it really became part of my daily routine. This can be really difficult to do, and it definitely takes practice and consistency in order for it to start improving your stress level and emotional well-being. So saying your new positive thought daily can really make a difference in your emotional well-being. So an example of this is, I'm going to have a horrible shift today. I've said this myself, right? Can change to, I'm going to do the best I can do to care for myself and my patients. I can do this. You might also try looking in the mirror as you say your positive thought. Sometimes that helps me. So now I would like you to think of a negative thought you've had in the last two weeks. I'll give you a little bit of time, like 30 seconds or to a minute, um, just because it's a webinar, but feel free to pause if you're listening to the recording. So once you have that thought, try to find a way to turn it into a positive thought. Try to transform that thought into a positive thought. Try repeating your new positive thought three times each morning when you wake up or evening if you're a night shift person. Try this for a couple of weeks. If it helps, try to build this into your daily routine moving forward. I'm sure many of you have heard of the word mindfulness, but I really wanted to take a few minutes and discuss what mindfulness is and why it's important. Mindfulness really deals with being present in the moment, okay? One of, and really focusing on something. One of the appealing aspects of mindfulness practice is that it can be integrated into daily life. But really to do that, you must have times when you formally practice, either with instruction or by intentionally setting aside time for it in, on your own. Research studies tend to find positive outcomes with just 10 minutes a day of daily practice. So simply becoming more aware might sound easy, but often we don't realize how distracted we are in our lives. And we need to really have that time to focus. We need to build that into our calendar. So I say that again, build it into your calendar. Retraining our minds takes time and effort, but really it is worth it. There are many different mindfulness interventions, but we'll practice a couple next. So the first mindfulness exercise I would like to discuss is guided imagery. Guided imagery allows you to lose, use all of your senses, your vision, taste, sound, smell, and touch to build images in your mind as a mindfulness exercise to alleviate stress and anxiety. You can practice this yourself with your own favorite relaxing place as a way to escape for a minute to minimize your anxiety and stress. My place that I like to go myself is Hamlin Lake in Ludington. My family and I vacation there in the summer, and I like to remember how it feels to sit on the beach with the, my, my feet in the water and the warm breeze and the seagulls uh, chirping. So what I, we're gonna practice a guided imagery next. So I'm gonna play the video. I want you to find a quiet place and sit, make sure you're sitting comfortably in your chair. I want you to find a comfortable place to sit. I'll give you a minute to get comfortable. When 
you are comfortable, take a few slow, even breaths. So I want you to inhale deeply, exhale slowly, paying attention to your chest rising and falling, really being mindful. When you are feeling relaxed, gently close your eyes. I want you to picture yourself lying on a beautiful secluded beach at sunset. Picture the soft sand on your feet, the waves gently rolling to shore, one right after the other. Picture a backdrop of trees on the horizon. Spend some time now being present in this moment, listening to the waves crash into the shore one by one. I want you to breathe in, notice any smells. Perhaps there are some lilacs in a field nearby. Notice the sound of the waves gently rolling onto shore and the birds in the trees behind you. Feel the cool sand underneath your feet and the crisp and refreshing evening air. Notice the taste of your favorite warm beverage as you bring it to your mouth. Maybe a coffee or a hot chocolate. Don't just picture the scene, but truly just touch it, taste it, smell it, as much as your imagination will allow. Stay in the scene for a minute. Notice how relaxed and calm you feel. Enjoy the feeling of relaxation as it spreads throughout your entire body, from your head to your toes. Notice how far away you feel from anxiety and stress. When you are ready, slowly come back through from the pen and open your eyes. Okay, so as you can see, this mindfulness activity only took a few minutes, but it can really help you to relax and calm your mind. If you are a nurse, you could practice this perhaps before going in the room of a complex patient to provide care. If you don't work at the bedside, maybe before you go to a stressful meeting or you need to have a crucial conversation with an employee or a peer. I often tell my students to try this in the moments before an exam or skills checkoff. We actually did this activity in my course last week. 
And during checkoffs this week, I, it was, I was really um, pleased to see that there was actually students that were doing just this. They were closing their eyes and imagining a different place to drift off to, um, to help ease their anxiety and stress. So I really encourage you to practice this technique. Okay. So next I wanna talk about deep breathing. So deep breathing is a great way to relax. We did some of this in the guided imagery exercise. When breathing deeply, your brain receives a message to really calm down and relax. There are a few different types of breathing exercises. So there's belly breathing, there's four, seven, eight breathing, there's roll breathing, morning breathing, there's many others. Some of these can be found on a U of M health site that I found. Um, there's the link there. We're going to briefly do a belly breathing exercise since it's really the easiest to learn. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get in a comfortable position. You wanna put one hand on your belly, just below your ribs, and the other hand on your chest. You take a deep breath in through your nose and let your belly push your hand out. Your chest should not move. Breathe out through pursed lips as if you were whistling. Feel the hand on your belly go in and use it to push all the air out. Do this breathing three to 10 times. And really take your time with each breath. Doing this before your shift or maybe even before returning from lunch or gowning up to go in a COVID room can really help you to become less stressed and anxious. So the next thing is one minute mindfulness exercises. So take an activity that you do every day, such as brushing your teeth and just be mindful and focused about yourself, noticing every sensory detail of brushing your teeth. Pay attention to the sensation of the brush against each and every tooth. Notice the smell and flavor of your toothpaste. Notice if you're thinking ahead to what you're gonna do next. And if so, gently bring your attention back to the present. Really stay in the moment. That's what mindfulness is about, is staying in the moment. You may wanna, the fingers and thumbs is positioning your fingers and thumbs facing down. Inhaling, clenching your fist tightly, and turning your hand over so your thumbs are facing up and exhaling. Imagine breathing into your fist. The next is uh, chocolate, eating chocolate. Take a piece of chocolate and mindfully eat it. Slow down, you wanna sense it, savor it, smile between bites, Pur purposely slow down. Use all your senses to see it, touch it, smell it and sense it. And you guys, I'm sure, can think of some other examples as well. Um, I did this with ice cream yesterday. I like ice cream. Do a fake yawn if you have to. That'll trigger real ones. So this is yawning, right? So say, ah, as you exhale. Notice how a yawn interrupts your thoughts and feelings. This brings you to the present. Then stretch re really, really slowly for at least 10 seconds. Notice any tightness and say ease or just hello to that place. You wanna be mindful without judgment and then go back to what you were doing. All right, so the next exercise we're gonna do is a mindful bell exercise, okay, for five minutes. We might go about three minutes, okay, just because of timing here. Um, and what I want you to do is you're going to pay attention to, you're going to focus on the sound. You're going to hear a bell, okay? When you hear that bell, it's going to get softer and softer, and you want to concentrate until it fades completely. This exercise will really help you to keep yourself firmly grounded in the present.
right, so how did that make you feel? Did you notice any other thoughts creeping in? Was it difficult to remain focused? So this can be a really good exercise on being mindful, being present in the moment. So next, I wanted to share and discuss some resources that are out there to support mental health and emotional well-being. Some of these I discussed earlier on in the presentation. Um, you know, but you know, they're focused on mental health and uh, mental health and emotional well-being, and really focus specifically in on nurses. Um, some are, are, you know, like the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline isn't just for nurses. The American Nurses Association is really focused on nurses. There's a website you can go to and a phone number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. This is what we talked about earlier. It's one of those um, resources. If you or a colleague is having suicidal thoughts, please call that number right away. There are trained mental health professionals that can help 24-7, 365. So really make sure you're aware of that resource. The American Nurses Association also has a number of resources. They have a page dedicated to nurse suicide prevention and resilience and prevention. There's also a COVID-19 resource center um, through the Wellbeing Initiative. These are some awesome resources through the ANA. Additionally, they have webinars that address emotional well-being of nurses, mental health, and many other topics. The Emotional PPE Project is an organization I found when researching for my DNP project. They offer free counseling from a volunteer mental health provider for healthcare providers. SAMHSA, or the Suicide, Suicide Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also has lots of um, uh, information and has um, a lot of resources as well. Um, and there's also a hotline there too. Michigan.gov also has some very helpful resources. Next, I wanted to share some useful apps. Some are free and some have a small fee. What I find helpful is that many of these apps um, ask you questions to get to know your individual needs and preferences, how you are feeling, and then individualize interventions and activities based on your answers. So there's different ones, and they're all focused on mental, on uh, mindfulness, on sleep, um, you know, different activities, and these are just a list of of some of those. There's some more here. Mind Shift is a good one. This is cognitive behavioral therapy, PTSD coach by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. The Veterans also has many, many more um, uh, uh, resources as well. They have many, many more apps. They have over 15 apps, uh, Veterans Affairs. Happify is another one of those apps that's very helpful. So next, what I want you to do is if you want to have quick access to any of these resources, I created a Google site. Um, so if you hold your smartphone camera, over the 2D barcode link, uh, and that'll take you to a site that I've created um, with the resources that were discussed today. So you can link to that site, and then it'll have all the links for all the sites that I mentioned, um, as well as all the apps. It'll have a picture of all the apps as well. So I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Hold your camera, open your camera app, hover over that barcode, and then that also has my contact information on there as well. Okay, so next I would like to um, acknowledge a couple people. So I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the guidance and support from a couple of our College of Nursing faculty. Dr. Goldstein uh, is the program director of the Psych Mental Health Nurse Practitioner uh, Program, and she's an expert in mental health. She provided me very valuable feedback and guidance in developing this presentation. Also, Dr. Jackie Eisler, she's, my, she's a uh, clinical nurse specialist program director at MSU and assistant professor. She's my mentor for my DNP project and has provided me guidance and support into developing this battle buddy intervention as well as this presentation. I'd like to thank both of them. So I'd like to thank all of you for attending this presentation about mental health and self-care for nurses. Remember to come up with a self-care action plan today. Schedule some time for you. And thank you for everything you do every day to care for the needs of others. Please stay safe and take care. If you have any questions on anything presented today, please don't hesitate to email me at martellm1 at msu.edu. Have a great day. I will now open it up to any questions.
Uh, thanks, Mike. So um, this is Morgan again. So I'm going to kind of moderate some of the questions. Uh, so um, thank you for uh, this is part of my script. Sorry, guys, but I'm going to stick to that. But thank you, Michael, for presenting on such a much needed topic. Um, I really, you know, I loved your discussion. I am a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, a recent graduate um, of a DMP program and also a bedside nurse who has worked in a variety of settings. Um, and I work at Sparrow now and a lot of the things that, I mean, this is so timely. The, the hospital, the organization that I work at is really um, focused on improving um, a lot about resiliency with the nursing force. There's, there's just a lot of stress going on with what is happening in the world with COVID and um, we, we really, the, the, they were really focused on trying to develop programs and get things out there to help the nurses. So this is, um, you know, all of this is so uh, timely and so important. Um, so I am going to um, come on back and look at the question and answer. So from Jessica Haas, I think, I have formed a battle buddy at work we had common ground starting nursing this year and came to rely on each other. What are some things we could do together or ways that I can support her? So I think one of the ways that are, that's a great question. Thank you, Jessica. Um, one of the ways that you can do is just to check in, I think two to three times a week, that just that emotional check-in, just how are you doing today? How are you feeling? very open-ended questions. Um, and then, you know, if there are things that are coming up, there's, you know, lots of resources. Um, you know, that a, a website is an excellent place for resources on building resilience um, and encouraging and improving emotional well-being. And so I think, you know, those are the biggest things is just in being that, um, that person to listen to. So just, you know, sometimes you don't need to say anything at all. Sometimes it's just that person to listen to, to validate feelings and to say, okay, I hear what you're going through. I hear what you're going through. These are real thoughts. These are real feelings um, and go from there. But that's just some advice. And I think that's great that you found that person. That's awesome. That's great. Good to hear. Thanks, Mike. So anybody else have questions? I'll give you a minute or two to see. I think if not, I always have questions and Marco, I think, and I think Marco had some questions too. I guess while people are typing, I was really, you know, so this, I was really struck by the 50% of nurses feeling overwhelmed in, in the survey. And I, from my own experience, like you had said, I, I have felt all of those things. Um, and I really, really liked the idea of developing or, or working into nursing programs and in education programs, you know, building resiliency among students. I, I'm also an instructor. Um, and so I, you talked about, you know, mindfulness exercises that you've used with your students. And I, I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit more about your, your experience with that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I mentioned, we've done some uh, guided imagery so far just this semester. We've done some guided imagery. We've talked about positive uh, self-talk, uh, taking some of those negative thoughts and turning them into positive ones. Um, and we've gotten some good feedback uh, from the students so far this semester. Uh, we also take mental health breaks throughout our lectures as well. We'll play, we'll all of a sudden in the middle of the PowerPoint, we'll have a funny picture of like an animal or um, just a, a silly picture or one of the beach, uh, just something not theory content related, just something else is like a mental break because it can be a lot uh, going through and people's really stress and anxiety can increase as content's being delivered. So we really uh, try to make it interactive and we try to make those mental breaks and build it right in. Um, but I, I like I, I mentioned before, it was really great this week in checkoffs. I was seeing some of the students actually saying, you know what, hold on, I need to take a, a break and close my eyes and go off to my beach. And I knew exactly what they were talking about because uh, we had done it in, in theory. So I was pretty excited to see that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I'm excited to read that Melnick article. It's, up, it's the one, I don't think it's out yet. I think it's coming out. Not the, quite. Yeah, yeah it's really cool. hot off the press. I got it from yeah, Dr. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so Rachel Justice. Hey, Rachel. Uh, but she had a question. Any tips for when you're in the moment and stuck in that negativity whirlwind? Like how do how to pull yourself back or get to that point or in the moment, uh, self-reflection or recognition? So I, I think kind of like you're in, you're stressed out, you're at work, you know, things are, your mind space is not good. Like, you know, kind of what would, 
any, did you come across any strategies to like sort of bring yourself back instead of all of the uh, more preventative um, measures? Yeah. So I think sometimes giving yourself a hug, right? That self-compassion can come into play there and just saying that it's okay to feel these things um, and just giving yourself some self-compassion and then maybe, you know, trying to turn some of those negative thoughts into positive ones, um, you know, but it's, it's easier said than done. It can be very challenging for sure. Sometimes even like, uh, you know, um, you know, thinking of your favorite song or like some music therapy all of a sudden in your head. Those are some of the things that I would probably recommend. Um, anything that's kind of a brief intervention that can kind of get you out of it or that guided imagery is also a really great um, idea as well. You can kind of just escape to that place. That's the whole point of guided imagery is to escape to that relaxing place. It helps calm down your emotions and then you can kind of think more clearly because um, sometimes things do get so overwhelming uh, that you just need that place to escape to. Thanks. And, and another question, um, going back to the battle buddies, I find peer support is extremely helpful, but with COVID, I find I'm not surrounded by my peers as often, and I've struggled somewhat without that support. Uh, how do you suggest finding and forming a battle buddy relationship in the current scenario? So I think Zoom is an important, uh, or any kind of virtual platform as far as meeting space. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's important that you know, you kind of meet face to face and a lot of times with, you know, we, we need to wear masks and socially distance and things like that. It can make it quite a bit of a challenge. Um, but I do know that you can do, um, you know, we can meet over Zoom uh, and those kind of things. And, and even like, you know, they can even sometimes for our battle buddy workshop, we'll even have everybody over Zoom and everybody's at least face to face. Um, you're not in person, but at least you're face to face and you're not wearing a mask and it's a little bit more personable. So I would probably um, recommend uh, some kind of virtual platform uh, as far as meeting. Oops, sorry, muted. Um, and then another question, um, other than CBT, which has been shown to be effective in numerous meta-analysis, uh, what level of evidence supports mindfulness, et cetera? So I guess a question about the strength of your evidence that you came across for mindfulness um, practices as opposed to CBT. Uh, so really, I, I kind of focused on doing a multitude of different event interventions. It's not really one versus another because it's really individualized to the person, right? So you have to kind of find out what works for you. I think the ones that I discussed today, there's um, some level of evidence to, to each one, some more than others, right? Um, but I think you have to determine what works best for you because everybody's an individual with their own individual thoughts and feelings. And so it really comes down to the individual person and what works for them more than anything, more than even the data. It's what works for you. Does that make sense? It does, it, it, but it does, you know, I think the, the, um, the person asking the question brings up a good a good point that in the research the um you know in my experience with it there is different outcomes that are measured different self-report types of things um different indexes that are used so it is um you know you when reading and digesting the information in terms of you know the research mm -hmm. is always important to oh, kind of absolutely that. Absolutely. Yeah, because it determines how effective this is, especially as the organizations are making decisions, you want to prioritize based on that evidence as well. So I've included some references. Um, I would encourage probably the person that asked that question, if you want, you can reach out to me on my email. I can kind of share some of those references, some articles that I referred to, um, rather than referring to them right now, that might be a little bit more of a uh, um, individualized thing, but I can definitely share that. So just please reach out to me, email me and I'll share that with you. I can even share the uh, PDFs of the articles. So just a couple comments that were made before we wrap it up, but um, uh, Simone Peraza, if I'm pronouncing that sort of right, thank you. It says, thank you. Appreciate your presentation and the great tools you're sharing, especially as it relates to mindfulness, positive self-talk and using therapy, nutrition and exercise. Um, Dr. Rhodes says, thank you for bringing forward this important topic. Um, I, uh, she likes the idea of um, incorporating um, the techniques into classes. And I guess for a last question, she wants to know, are you collecting data for your DNP, Mike? Uh, yes, I am. So I'm using the well-being index. I got permission to use that um, to evaluate pre and post um, intervention. I'm doing one in the beginning and then one at six weeks and one at the uh, final 12 weeks. 
Um, and then hopefully we can expand it from there. Um, I'm also doing some surveys, like kind of informal surveys about the Battle Buddy workshops themselves. Uh, just some asking some general questions about the effectiveness so I can improve each one as well. Um, so I'd say as far as data and outcomes, uh, that's really what I'm looking at to evaluate. And it's the well-being index in the Mayo Clinic um, is the one that I'm using. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. And then I think um, that was actually the last question. Um, you can read in the chat, but there's a lot of thank yous to you, Mike, cool. and um, you know, really great job, which I definitely concur with. Um, so uh, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, awesome. I want to thank you again, Michael, soon to be Dr. Michael Martell, <laughs> and um, all of you that were able to spend the afternoon um, with us. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to get a question answered, you can email Mike, and um, he has his email address available, uh, but it's Martel, M1, M-A-R-T-E-L-M, the number one at msu.edu. And stay tuned uh, for more information about upcoming conversations, uh, webinars in the near future, and you can always keep in touch with the College of Nursing on social media. So. Take care everyone and thanks to Marco for uh, for organizing all this for us. And thanks again, Mike, Michael Martel, you did a great job. <laughs>